this athletic show brought to you in association with the square ball dan and michael from the square ball phil hayes here from the athletic as well let's talk about bielsa and his legacy at Leeds united because we've seen a huge outpouring of emotion has it surprised you at all or did you expect to see a reaction like we've seen no i, I thought it would be like this and i think it's been accentuated by the fact that it has been a sacking in the end rather than a natural partner of ways i think had had it ended as everybody wanted it to end which was at the conclusion of a season and in a summer where the club and and Bielsa decided that they were going to go their separate ways and it was all fairly amicable and people could reflect on it in that way a little bit like they did with Pablo Hernandez at the end of last season then it it might have been slightly more more muted but I think the shock of the weekend um contributed to it um and so did Bielsa himself I mean my my experience at Leeds going back through the years when I've written about them is that the they're different to, to other clubs and it's quite intangible. It's quite hard to explain what it is about them that, that makes them different. But I don't, Leeds are sort of distinctly Leeds and I don't th- I don't see a lot of what I see in Leeds in, in other clubs. Um, and I think it does come down to soul and I'm not saying that other clubs don't have soul. I just think that Leeds have one that is, is very unique and is different. And they found in Bielsa a manager who was a coach, person who was also completely different, and it almost extended the the tradition of that. It did things differently. He, he he was unusual with a lot of his methods. He was unusual with his approach to the media and his approach to referees and and VAR. I mean, I was trying hard on a Monday to think if he ever ever criticised a referee at any point and I don't think he did there were times where he got into the ribs of the FA um, for example um, over the um, the Aston Villa game at home when there was all the argument over whether um, Conor Huran should have been sent off for punching um, punching Bamford you know that that clearly upset him and he had a lot to say about it but he was at, he was absolutely rigid in being able to come into a press conference after any game with any result some fixtures in which you'd had some fairly baffling either VAR decisions or refereeing decisions and just leave it at the door and never, never get involved. And he must have been angry in the background from from time to time. But all of that sort of stuff, it, it made Leeds think that they had something special. It made Leeds feel as if, I think more than anything, as if they had something that suddenly other clubs were envious of and other clubs and other fan bases would have wanted. And I don't think that was something that you could have said about Leeds really at, at any stage in the previous 16 years. You know, Leeds have become a kind of subject of ridicule. Um, and there was a lot of defiance internally, you know, the, the support fought against that and and were as proud as they could be of the club. But Bielsa did this weird thing where people started to like Leeds. You know, people started to take an interest, not just globally, and the global interest was was really wide and, and became really massive, but also within the country. You know, fans of other of other clubs started to look at it and say, well, irrespective of who he's managing, I actually really like the football here. And then they would look at their own football and, and their own club and what was going on, and they would say, I wouldn't mind that here. You know, that, that would be absolutely great. But the problem with Bielsa for, for other clubs was, firstly, that he was never going to manage anybody else in England. But... Whereas with players, I mean, Leeds have had some quality players over the years, many of whom they've they've had to sell. Players can be bought and a lot of managers can be bought, but you were never, ever going to be able to buy Bielsa. You were never going to get him out of here. So no matter how much you liked what was going on here, however much you looked at it and thought, it's like a bit of a cultural revolution in Leeds. You know, this is, this is like something you just don't often see um, with managers. If you want Leeds, it was never, ever going to be yours because you just wouldn't have it. And I, I don't know... Uh, he will, I can say it confidently, I don't think he'll ever manage another club in the Premier League or in England. And I don't know if he'll ever manage anybody else now. I mean, it, it's for him to say and, and for him to know. But it's just it was just the perfect meeting of minds, I think. I, I was saying in the piece I did on Sunday, it was like chaos theory, where you had a head coach who a lot of people across the world said was unmanageable. You had a club who a lot of people in England, including a lot of Leeds fans, felt was basically unmanageable. And they collided and it was just absolutely glorious. The stuff you were saying about him being not taking another job in England is interesting because I think that was part of the, almost part of the joy of it was him being linked with jobs like Arsenal and Man United and jobs that truthfully, most other managers, you would have taken a look at him and you'd have gone, well, if they do want him, they could probably, they could probably take him. With Bielsa, you didn't worry actually, you just, you sort of went, well, that's just, that's stupid talk sport, just, just making stuff up here. There's not a chance he's taking those jobs. And 
going on Twitter and seeing fans of those clubs go, well, if he gets an offer from there, of course he's going to he's gonna come. And you know, people were like blame Ronaldo as their avatar, that kind of thing. But yeah, we all knew. It was like, I described it this week as being like let into the world's best secret. We all knew he'd never go do that. He'd never go work for one of those clubs. But the modern Premier League fan has convinced themselves that money and status is everything. And they actually, also uh, wouldn't have had Bielsa, it's not yeah. to say, with his, with his, uh, his various um, vagaries, but still... Well, exa- exactly. He runs complete, he was the complete antithesis to modern football. And I think that's why we loved him. And that's why he fit at Leeds, because in many ways, Leeds is a bit of a throwback club in sometimes the worst ways, sometimes the very best of ways. Yeah, and, and really authentic. And that goes for Ellen Road as well. You know, th- it's funny to think that there will come a time further down the line if Leeds do develop the stadium um, and modernise in, in many of the ways that they plan to, where they'll actually have far more in, in the way of selling points for a coach of his level you know but I think he'll feel that he's been really lucky to see Ellen Road as it is you know to see Ellen Road as it as it is in sort of one of the last bastions of old-fashioned football as everything everything strays into you know sparkling new stadiums and you know doing the things that the Premier League kind of demands that you do and and, and following the herd I mean Michael was talking there about being linked to other jobs he wasn't, was he? At, at no stage was he ever credibly linked to another position. There might have been a bit of muttering here or there. Spurs would quite like Bielsa, this, that, the other. The, the only way I could ever have seen it happening was if Leeds had caught him on the hop and let him go before he was ready. And he thought to himself, well, actually, I like it here. And I'd quite like to have a crack somewhere else. I think I think what other clubs might not have realised was the links you have to go to in order to accommodate him. Um, and also, anybody who, who looked at him and thought, I oh, will get him mid-season, is totally misjudging the fact that when it comes to taking jobs, Bielsa thinks about them for weeks and weeks and months. I don't think in January you can say to him, do you want to come and take over at Arsenal? I just don't think he'd do it. He'd probably say to them, well, you know, I'd, I'd need ages to analyse your squad and decide who I like and who I don't. You know, I'd take my time. I'd never never jump into it. But it was never going to become a, a conversation because he would, n- he would never have exited of his own accord unless there had been, you know, unless there was something that went on, fallout or or whatever else that meant that the relationship had broken down completely. But in terms of defection, he, he's probably the manager who you always knew was never ever on one random Wednesday morning going to roll up at Old Trafford or Anfield. And I think what made him, uh, he's not dead, so I should say what makes him <laughs> <laughs> um, such an enigmatic character is that you see these gestures and like giving the kids the lollipops and hearing these stories of him visiting people to say thank you for doing things for him. Like there's one guy who tweeted to say that he used to drop in Marcelo's favourite Argentinian and Chilean like tea and biscuits. Mate, James Rowlands, I'll give him a give him a mention. He used to fly. He, he used he works for British Airways. I'm sure he won't mind me saying. And he used to fly to um, Argentina. So he used to run to uh, Buenos Aires. I think more than more often than not these days, it's Chile that he goes to. But he did. He used to fly home with um, Bielsa's favourite chocolates and all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he dropped him off and then Bielsa, when he left, one of his final acts before he left Leeds after being sacked was to go to James's house and say thank you. So you see all these, these incredible stories of humanity. But then when it came to like the football side, you always got that kind of, that very um, matter of fact veneer. Like you say, he never criticised anything, he never got drawn into anything vaguely emotional like in the, in the post-match um, interviews or the press conferences or anything like that. But then every now and then there was a little chink in the armour and you would see just these incredible displays of emotion. For example, the documentary when Leeds got promoted to see him embracing um, Calvin Phillips, you know, like, and moments that you just, you you kind of, you're so glad you witnessed um, even secondhand. And then the, um, the other one is, I think, the emotion that we've, we didn't see it, did we? But all the people who went to see him at Thorpe Arch, and I include John Richardson in this, who we spoke to on one of our podcasts, um, who went up there to see him and he was too upset to get out of the car. And that, I think, I think as a final, as a bookend of his, of his time at Leeds, to get that display of emotion, I think as kind of it, it's it's added to the myth. And when I say myth, I, I don't mean it in the sense that it's not real. I mean like the myth and the legend. He takes a, a huge amount of satisfaction from the way that football pleases the fans, and I think one of the reasons that he was able to um, let himself go with promotion was because. He, he talks a lot and he can see himself that so much of professional football these days is wrapped up in money and commerce and self-interest and everything else. And it doesn't excite him. It doesn't please him. It's not, not what he likes. Um, you, you, you never, 
you could never pretend that he's working for free. You know, he's on a very, very big salary at Leeds, but he doesn't like the way in which money kind of infects. You know, he talked a lot latterly about the, the fixture list, how busy it was, and the fact that, you know, the reason for that was because people were making cash out of it. And, and a lot of the people who were making big money out of it weren't actually the players or, or the managers um, or the, the people actually involved in the games. But when it comes to the public, there's no investment there apart from emotional investment and investment of time and love and, you know, interest in him, in which they get nothing in return other than the results in the football, which he sort of, you know, pushes himself to deliver properly. Um, I wrote in the piece a couple of weeks ago where I was, I was talking about, you know, is this summer going to be the point where Leeds and Bales actually finally decide, look, maybe we'll, we'll go our separate ways. And clearly that was superseded by, by what's going on this weekend. But I finished that piece of the story about a, a young boy called Harry who um, who had a photo taken with Bielsa at Thorpe Arch and I've actually had the chance to see the photo since um, and it's Harry stood in front of Bielsa, um, Bielsa's got his hands on his face and the two of them are just grinning wildly and it's, it's a beautiful pic. So um, Harry wrote to Bielsa and said, would you sign this for me? You know, he sent his photo. Um, to which Bielsa said, I will, and here it is, and sent it back, but then said to him, I want you to sign a photo for me so that I can keep it with your signature on, which Harry, as far as I can tell, did, sent it back, um, and it's something that he can take away with him. And I just, people don't often fall in love properly with managers, do they? You know, it, even managers who do well at clubs and, and, and so on, it, it doesn't tend to go like this, and it doesn't tend to endure like this, and it doesn't tend to, to build up to the extent where Bielsa could come back on any day, any time, and would just have crowds of people fighting to to see him. It's like, it's like rock star status for somebody who is so far from rock star mentality. You, you know, you, you almost can't, you almost can't explain it. There was a really a lovely lack of cynicism about it all as well with Bielsa because you sometimes see clubs pumping out kind of feel good videos or whatever, which the the club could have done hundreds of with Bielsa. You know how he's helping. Cause we've been we've been kind of taking stories of him and how he's bringing people's ill parents and stuff. And they didn't. He he wanted that kept out of the media. He was like he was doing this for himself, and he wanted that picture for himself. And it's not. It none of it was for show with him. It was all it was all genuine, and the emotions were kind of rare when you saw them from him. But when you when you saw them, you knew they were real, and that it, that meant it was meaningful. Yeah, it, it reminds me of you know when you see people just as an example um, helping a homeless person but they're filming it all to put it on socials. It's the opposite of that, isn't it? It's like, no, I don't want this putting out there. I'm doing this because it's the right thing so to do. Some of the, I mean, which people are now are kind of sharing now he is gone, but letters and stuff that he sent where he'd, he'd send kids signed shirts and stuff. And um, like I say, he's kind of speaking to people on, you know, in hospital and stuff. And he'd send them letters and stuff. And it, it would always say on the bottom, just, just don't put this on social media, please. And he'd go and visit people and say, you can have pictures and stuff, but if you could just not, make a big deal out of it and that's lovely i think in an era when a lot of people would seek validation or seek like the i guess the easy win of being like look aren't i aren't i being a great guy here yeah he's, he's just a nice he's, person he's, because he's what, a nice person what i loved about it as well was that it, it, nobody at the club was ever going to interfere with any of it so if bales invited random people to the training ground random people just came to the training ground and that was it and there was no argument with it and it was his domain and that's what happened if he wanted to write to people and send them letters or shirts or photos he just did it and it was done every every single morning and again there was never going to be any question of well you know if, if we send signed shirts out to some people everybody's going to want them we're going to have this that and the other he just didn't he would never have wanted to wanted to hear that because again he would look at signed shirts and say well you know what what is the value of this to you know a club or a manager versus the value of it to a supporter who will will treasure it and and will want it and i think he got perfectly the the mood and the attitude in leeds i think he understood perfectly what it was that people in leeds wanted which was a team they could respect and admire and and ultimately love but also a, a manager who was just in it in the same way that that they were and, and i think, a, a I think complete, it lack was. Of, complete lack of ego that's the thing like why why do we need to keep this shirt or why do we need to say no to this request the only reason you would say no to that request is because you wanted to basically do a power move 
and demonstrate your own ego. You know, that's a, that's at the root of a power move, isn't it? Like, I have control over this. You can't have that shirt. Where actually, that's never that was never all, on the agenda with Bielsa. All because you think people are on the take. You know, you think people are saying, oh, you know, I'd love this. Get I'd it on eBay. <laughs> well, yeah, no, yeah. no, absolutely. And, you know, you do see a lot of, I don't mean Leeds United particularly, but you see a lot of club merchandise that does, you know, sign stuff that does show up on eBay and and, and people do. But it seems to me that if, if you got your hands on something that was signed by Bielsa and... You, you, your first thought was to make money. It well, it was you know to sell it, um, and and to do that as opposed to keeping it. Then you're absolutely insane. I mentioned the other day that the the signed copy of our promotion special we did. I've not got a huge amount of valuable merchandise or or kind of memorabilia at all, but that's one that's one thing that I will really really treasure, and I I treasure it that much that unfortunately I can't look at it because it it lives in a sealed jiffy bag. I, I was just going to say that is one of those things that for the rest of your life you will constantly think, I hope nothing happens to that. Because Great grandkids it, will probably chuck it in a bin at some well, they, point. Well, they probably will. Won't they? <laughs> I can't, can't really make that signature out. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but but you will. You you whenever you think about that, the one thought that'll be in your head is. I hope that never gets damaged or ever gets lost or, or anything like that. Um, and if you do put it on eBay, um, Daniel will kill you. <laughs> it says, it's, it's got my name on it too, so that yeah. makes, that's kind I, of what, what doubles it as doubles the value of it to my eyes. Yeah, and I can only, only sell mine to a Dan um, for it to be worth its full value. <laughs> but um, I was going to say, actually, when we spoke to John Richardson earlier in the week, John brought a point up, actually, about what Bielsa has enabled us to do is to enjoy football as kids again. Like when you first got into it without all the cynicism and the money being a factor, it was just a very, it's kind of very pure, uh, very idealistic, very optimistic. And I think the reaction to him leaving, I can only draw a parallel to it being like losing your first love. Like when you break up with your first love when you're a teenager or whatever it might be, and it feels like the end of the world because it's all rooted in idealism and optimism and you never see it ending, do you? And um, Moscow actually over on our show said something about that um, in the last couple of days is that we never saw past Bielsa we never knew what was going to come next even though I think we all sort of knew it would come to an end one day we never really wanted to think about nobody it nobody ever wanted to think about it that that was the point because you knew that I mean to talk about it in cold hard facts the, 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 the biggest decision for Leeds since appointing Bielsa is how to replace him what what do you do and how do you move on from that in a way that doesn't only allow you to be competitively successful but still engages people i mean i got around to writing something i should have written a while ago really on tuesday which is that the the more you look at this and the more you follow the reaction over the weekend and the more you think about the fact that bielsa's gone because you know it's about protecting premier league status how how does the premier league make you happy in the way that bielsa seem to make people happy people were just ha like happy to be in the bubble um which i think is why some were able to say if we went down with him as manager i, I would accept it because there was kind of more to it than well it transcended it, it was, transcended yeah, the premier it, league didn't it well it did and and also just you know every, everything that the premier league is about which is like say commerce and sponsorship development increasingly things like crypto these days i mean i mean to, to ask you a question Nobody seems to like crypto. No support seems to like crypto. It, people are skeptical of it. People are worried about the fact that the regulation of it isn't, you know, isn't, good, there, in, isn't good enough. No, it doesn't, doesn't really exist. So why I does, trust John Terry. <laughs> so, so why do so many clubs do sponsorship deals with crypto companies? Because it's money. Because it's money. That's the thing you see. And in their slight defence, the way football is going and the way it's working, you need more money than ever to compete in a division like this and the better you, you want to get the more money you need again and, and that's what it's all kind of focused on whereas with with Bielsa it was wider than that people could listen to him for hours when he got going on his, his philosophy his press conferences were always way more interesting when he was talking about philosophy and, or his philosophy and you know the sort of broader interest than it was when he was talking about Patrick Bamford's foot you know the the injury stuff was just like right okay and and latterly it was different because the injury stuff was just dominating everything because it was so important to the team and, and results but initially it was kind of like right get the team news out of the way because he never really worries about who's in and who's out he just puts the team out and they play well all the time anyway um and then you would get into the really interesting stuff about him and I just think it made people feel like they could enjoy it indefinitely and I think you're right I'd, even now I'm not sure any of us had properly got our heads around what it was going to look like when it all finished. His views on football as a whole were 
in some ways just incredibly simple and obvious well yeah that's, that's, <laughs> that's the, the thing, thing with it. yeah it, but it's it was it was the stuff no one else was saying no one that no one else was saying well we don't need any more money bales's opinion was very much you get more money you just chuck it on the fire with the rest with the rest of the the premier league it, because that's all you do with it you give yeah. it the money instantly goes back out on transfers on wages yeah on and then you then you go oh, we really have to go on this tour to so and so so we can earn some more money again again a bad decision but just chuck it on the fire and we'll and we'll come back next season and we'll need more again and he he recognized that and yeah. i think i think yeah. it was refreshing to hear someone in a position of power actually saying what's the, what's this for well yeah. it's like emperor's new clothes in the sense that everybody knows that there are far too many games and the fixture list is far too intense so bielsa sits down and says too many games and suddenly you know the people who run the game are, are they're going Oh, he said it now, isn't he? He said it. Somebody's actually said this, you know. <laughs> but it is. It's staring you in the face, and it's it is common sense. A lot, a lot of it. It's not to say he was right on everything. It's not to say that anybody would, would ever be right in the way that that they see everything. But I think he probably, as much as anyone, was able to see football through the eyes of both a coach and a, a supporter.